The Midday Meal is a national welfare program in India that was implemented with the sole goal of ending classroom hunger. Thanks to the program, about 120 million children now have access to a daily meal through the school year. Many experts consider the Midday Meal to be one of the best things that has happened in the history of Indian welfare. Success has gone beyond the immediate goal of filling bellies too. The midday meal has had a very positive impact for gender inequality in India. It's taken some stress off of parents, especially working mothers, as it removes one thing from their long to-do list by ensuring that they don't have to pack lunch for their school-going kids in the morning. It also employs thousands of women who cook the meals and work to ensure an efficient distribution system. But what's on the plate is politics, and the midday meal is wrought with political struggles, lack of funding, and interference by industry in religious and corporate lobbies. Moreover, debates about the egg have shown themselves to be more about expressing religious ideologies than about nutrition. By uncovering what lies behind debates like these, we realize a difficult truth about the program. While its primary mandate is to feed children and feed them well, political agendas can overtake this in a way that children become fairly secondary to the discussion. This is Bad Table Manners, a show that seeks to push the boundaries of food reporting and narrative in South Asia. I'm your host, Meher Varma. I'm super fortunate to have Jean Drez, the Belgian-born Indian activist, development economist and author on my show today. He begins by extolling the program's many benefits. So the Midday Meal program in India is... I think quite an extraordinary program. Basically, it consists of providing hot cooked meals to school children every day of the school year. So first of all, the coverage is uh, quite enormous. I mean, we're talking of something like 120 million children being fed every day, everywhere. I mean, this is one program that you will find in every village, no matter how remote. And I think it's also quite unusual in terms of the wide range of benefits that it has and the fact that these benefits are quite well documented. So I think it's really one of the best things that have happened in social policy in India in the last few years. Jean explains that there's an important link between the midday meal and increasing enrollment in school programs. For decades in India, several attempts to increase attendance, and especially attendance for girl students, has been a societal goal. Almost nothing has worked as well as the midday meal. And in this way, it has been a long-awaited breakthrough. I think one of the features of the school meal program is that it serves many goals, actually. One of them, of course, is to ensure that children are not hungry in the classroom. That was one of the main objectives initially. But it also serves other objectives. For example, it helps to reduce exclusion from the schooling system because it increases school attendance, in fact, quite dramatically. It contributes also, of course, not just to eliminating hunger, but to improving nutrition among children. And there is evidence also that it contributes to better learning achievements because children learn better when they are not hungry. And then on top of that, there are, I think, important benefits for women in the form, for example, of direct employment as uh, cooks and helpers in the school kitchens. I mean, it's actually one of the largest employment programs in the world, employing mainly poor women from disadvantaged communities. And it also helps other women as well, because they don't have to worry about cooking for their children in the day. I mean, that can be quite a relief, especially for women who work outside the household. So it has quite a range of benefits. I wonder why the midday meal has been so successful compared to other welfare programs in India. The answer Jean gives me is perhaps so profound because it's so simple. Simple to the extent of it being obvious. Jean tells me that experts have often wondered what we'd even did before it. It's not theoretically complex, it's easy to execute, easy to manage, and it's best managed when it's managed locally. I think it's relatively successful because it makes so much sense. I mean, in fact, when we look back, we wonder how did we think that children could spend five or six hours at school without eating anything? 
of course, some of them would go back in between to eat at home, but then some of them might not come back. So it's a fairly obvious thing to do. And it's not a very complicated thing to do. I mean, basically, you mobilize local women to cook the food, you buy the ingredients mostly locally, you have to build a simple kitchen shed and so on and do a little bit of uh, accounting. So it's not something very complicated. It's much, much simpler, for example, than teaching children. So I think the fact that it was a simple, practical initiative with wide-ranging benefits is one reason why it was so successful. As Jean alluded, the program has also helped to break down caste and gender barriers, a super powerful thing in a country where utensils are still divided to separate the ostensibly pure from the polluted. The midday meal actually created a brand new scenario where children from different castes would eat together. This sharing, though, has caused some resistance, particularly from upper caste parents. One of the ways in which the caste system enforces and perpetuates itself is by restrictions on what people call interdining, so the sharing of uh, food and meals between different castes. So the castes are not supposed to uh, share meals with each other. So that contributes to imposing the caste system. So when children at an early age, when their consciousness of caste, in fact, becomes formed at the primary and upper primary level, get used to sitting together and sharing a meal with children of all castes and class and gender, that helps to break these barriers of caste. And in fact, that is one reason why there was some resistance initially to midday meals, mainly from upper caste parents, because they were reluctant to let their children share a meal with children of what they considered to be lower caste. My next guest on this episode is Ritika Kera a development economist and associate professor in economics at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. She says that two successive chief ministers in the state of Tamil Nadu were instrumental in helping roll out the program because they themselves experienced classroom hunger as children. I learned from her that the program was criticized in the media early on because of arguments that the classroom is just a place to study and thus providing food to kids could take away from this. Some actually still believe this. For many years, this success was seen in Tamil Nadu. And then in the 90s, the central government decided to start it as a central government scheme. And actually, in the initial years of that, it didn't really work in all states the way it did in Tamil Nadu, because a lot of states basically just said that we'll give dry rations. So, you know, uncooked rice and wheat to children who have 80% attendance in school. And not all states, so there were a bunch of states that were providing a cooked food before the 2001 Supreme Court order. So for many years in many parts of the country, it functioned as a dry ration scheme, which was basically like a family top up, right? If you give uh, two or three kilos every month to children, it just goes into the family pot. It wasn't until about 20 years ago that the midday meal became a mandate countrywide when the Supreme Court intervened and said the scheme needs to be implemented in letter and spirit. It was at this point that we saw a shift from it being a program that could get away from supplying just dry rations to fresh food. This mandate led to some controversy and pushback. At the same time, newspapers were filled of images of students lined up with empty plates in protest. I asked Rithika to explain a bit more about what was behind these acts of resistance. When the Supreme Court passed this order saying you must implement midday meals in spirit, which is to give cooked food, not dry rations, the rollout of it was very staggered. So I described to you some states where they were worried about violating the court's mandate. And so they said, no matter what, we'll provide cooked food, even if it means just boiling wheat and giving that, and also making children run around with teachers to get the boiling pot going. (laughs) So I had in mind very much Rajasthan, which is where I was working at the time. But in states like Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, UP also, I think, the implementation was tardy and, you know, things were not really moving. And so at that time in Rachi, in Jharkhand, a bunch of people decided that to shake the government, state government, out of its inaction. 
they would be shamed by people lining up the streets with empty thali saying we're waiting for our meal to be served to us so now for some tangibles what exactly does a midday meal even look like a few veggies rice and a dal i imagine Jean tells me more and introduces me to the very contentious issue of the egg and to the fact that state budgets control more than anything how well kids are fed. If we need any more evidence that food is politics, this is it. The menu would vary between regions, it also varies between days of the week. So most schools have a menu with different items for different days of the week, but mostly it's food grain, rice, vegetables. There are nutritional norms, for example, under the National Food Security Act, which has made school meals a permanent legal entitlement. There are norms that you should provide, for example, at the primary school level, 450 calories per child per day and 12 grams of protein. And then in the guidelines, there are more specific norms like, you know, so many grams of rice or wheat and so on. But I think that's ultimately what really determines the nutritional value is the budget. The calorific standards that Jean stated are norms that come from nutrition experts in India, such as the National Institute of Nutrition. He says that an expert committee also reviews and revises these standards from time to time. According to what Ritika has seen in many states, especially the southern and eastern states, the meal will consist of a rice and also very often an egg, which she too, like Jean says, is a very important part of the story. More on that in a second. In the northern and western states you're much more likely to see chapatis rotis because that's what the local population eats the quality and the nutrition of the food has been a big debate so you know in the 90s i would say the struggle was to move from dry rations to cooked food and then through the 2000s the struggle was to ensure that this cooked food was provided regularly and everywhere no matter what and then i would say in the 2010s the last 15 20 years the struggle has been to improve the nutrition content and so i've seen in tamil nadu children eating eggs quite merrily with their sambar and rice in rajasthan when the supreme court mandate came and because they didn't have systems in place and because they were worried about violating the supreme court's mandate they were just boiling wheat and either adding some salt or sugar on on alternate days that's how it started but very quickly moved on to providing chapatis with some vegetable eggs have made their way into the program after much resistance the vegetarian hindu high caste lobby which is currently in power is largely responsible for this they have maintained their no egg charge despite there being ample evidence that eggs are what john and others have described as a wonder food for kids especially in a program that has to feed them on this scale. The debate over eggs and vegetarianism in India is far from new and the discussion about what place eggs occupy in the Indian moral universe is ongoing. In a 2015 article about the debate over eggs, the online Indian news publication Scroll quoted Mahatma Gandhi's logic on the subject. He said because quote sterile eggs are also produced by hens and a sterile egg never develops into a chick he who can take milk should have no objection to taking sterile eggs end quote While people often read into this all logic seems to be currently put aside to promote the larger interests of the vegetarian Hindu lobby Just as recently as December 2021 the New York Times reported that the Indian state's crackdown on eggs is not just rampant but also pretty successful. In the Indian state of Gujarat, where Prime Minister Modi is from, the sight of egg carts on the streets that have been part of the common city landscape have begun to vanish. Egg cart raids are now events that the city commonly experiences. It's important to remember, however, that the interests of this lobby run counter to dietary facts. Egg consumption in India has grown substantially in recent years. According to the same article, Indians now eat an average of 81 eggs per year. I think that the first state that introduced eggs must have been Tamil Nadu. In fact, the entire school meal scheme itself was first pioneered by Tamil Nadu, uh, starting on a very small scale one century ago in the 1920s. And then a larger program was introduced in the 1950s 
and then there was a decisive move in 1982 when it became a universalized program for all school children, at least in government schools. Eggs are a kind of dream food for growing children, not just for the children, but for the program itself, because first of all, it's very nutritious. It has most of the important nutrients, except one or two, like vitamin C. It beats anything else in terms of nutrition per rupee. So it's uh, also very affordable. It's safe. Eggs have a long shelf life. And uh, children love them. I mean, they really like eggs. It's very popular, ticking all the right boxes. So there's a really strong case for making that a national policy. Unfortunately, in some states, there is resistance to eggs being served in school meals, mainly from upper caste vegetarian lobbies, which is very unfortunate. You know, nobody is saying that we should force children to have eggs in with their midday meal. What we are saying is that we should give them the option. And if some children from vegetarian families don't want an egg, then they can be given something else like a banana or something. So it's very unfortunate that these upper caste vegetarians are not, they are not resisting eggs for themselves. They are trying to impose their own norms on other people. He says this resistance has made it impossible for eggs to be introduced in a number of states where an upper caste Hindu lobby is in power. And if the chief minister of a state doesn't eat eggs, the chances of children having access to them is next to none. I wanted to know more about Ritika's take on the politics of the egg. She tells me something that I had never thought about before. Because eggs can't be diluted, unlike say dal or other forms of protein that can be watered down, and often are, their place in the program is well worth fighting for. So I have often described eggs as the original superfood. Because, you know, they have all nutrients that are required, except vitamin C, which you can easily add by, you know, if it's a boiled egg, you can squeeze a lime and you have your vitamin C also. That's one thing, the nutritional element of it. But the other thing is that it's a very nutrient dense food, right? So it's a small volume. An egg is very small and especially for children under six which is really the age group where nutrition interventions need to be made. So for children with tiny stomachs, nutrient-dense foods are really important and eggs are therefore one of the best options. we have. It's not the only option, but it's certainly one of the best. And given the practicalities of rural India, where refrigerated storage may not be an option, so you know that rules out things like meat and milk. The other important thing is that unlike pulses and lentils, eggs can't be diluted, right? So lentils are a great source of protein as well. But the problem that we have noticed in many parts of the country, not everywhere, is that they tend to add too much water, which is also, by the way, the case with milk. So it's practical and it's super nutritious and therefore a really important thing. And Thirdly, most Indian families are unable to afford eggs. Now, there has been a resistance to it. Even though Mahatma Gandhi has said that eggs are vegetarian, many people consider it non-vegetarian. And the vegetarian lobby tends to be super influential where it is active. So, for instance, in Madhya Pradesh, which is a state with amongst the highest, if not the highest rates of undernutrition among children, whenever this egg proposal has been brought before the state government, a small lobby of Jains has resisted it. First of all, it's a relatively rich community, so it's unlikely that their children go to government schools. But in any case, nobody is forcing all children to, ha- even if their children go to these schools where eggs might be served, nobody is forcing their children to eat them, right? But still, they just, they completely veto it and the state governments have given in. It's not surprising, based on what we've outlined about caste and food in India, that the egg resistance is coming from high caste, powerful political groups that earn their power by trickily being important stakeholders in the welfare program like the Jain community that Ritika just introduced us to, who are the richest religious group in India. Their lacto-vegetarian diet rejects the consumption of any meat, fish, or eggs. Eating these foods, it's believed, creates negative karma, as it's an act of violence. 
there is an organization called Akshay Patra, which, by the way, I think has incredibly good press. Last I checked, they were providing midday meals to about 10% of schools in Karnataka state. But because they are backed by powerful people and there is also some kind of religious connotation to Akshay Patra, they tend to have a lot of say in the policies in Karnataka state. And again, same story, whenever Karnataka government has been told or has considered the proposal to bring eggs in the midday meal program, in fact, there is an Indian Express article where they say it's either us or eggs, more or less. And I would say, yeah, then the government should show them the door and say, go, (laughs) because it's only 10% of schools, right? And in any case, the government provides them free wheat and rice for the midday meal program. And it provides them exactly the same per child rupee cooking cost, conversion cost. So it's not like they're doing that much of a favor, in a sense, you know, to the government. It's not saving them money. What is interesting in the Karnataka story is that in the Anganwadis, the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, which is for children under six, which also, by the way, provides meals to children under six, three to six-year-olds, there the Karnataka state government does provide eggs. And there it is because Akshay Patra's presence is even smaller. I think it's barely 1%. So (laughs) it is very frustrating when nobody is saying that anyone should be forced to eat an egg. Eggs are the highlight of the day for many children and therefore taking them off the program is both a nutrition and emotional problem. In fact, Vitika tells me that in a recent survey conducted in Kerala, children said that one of the biggest things that they missed about school during the COVID-19 lockdowns was getting their eggs. So I ask her, If political parties are so opposed to eggs, what are their alternatives? Some states think of milk as a kind of substitute for eggs. In other cases, they say we'll give soya beans, which are also high protein. But again, I think not quite comparable to eggs for all the other nutrients. And then in other places yet, they say we'll give a fruit. So in Rajasthan, sometimes I've seen a guava being served or bananas. But again, I mean, these things are good, but not good enough. Aside from the egg problem, the program has also suffered some poisoning. While these instances are serious and they definitely deserve some scrutiny, it's unfortunate how they've been manipulated to further political interests. Jean tells me more. All this goes back to a Supreme Court order of 28th November 2001, when the Supreme Court directed the state and central governments to ensure that midday meals are being served in all the government and government-aided schools. In the years that followed, for about five to six years, there were a number of issues. There was the resistance from some upper-caste parents. There was resistance from some teachers who were worried that this would be one more responsibility for them. That was a time when there were no kitchen sheds. Uh, In some states, even the cooks had not been appointed. And by default, some of the work initially fell on the shoulders of the teachers. And obviously, for good reasons, they resented that. Over time, these problems gradually were removed. There were also, unfortunately, occasionally instances of food poisoning. Those were the biggest setbacks. The program also underwent a significant controversy in the early 2000s. And it revolved around biscuits. When I read about a proposal for something like the biscuit, replacing something hearty and wholesome like dal, I thought a lot about the fragility of the suggestion and how it was embodied in a literal, real, flaky biscuit. In 2008, there was a brazen attempt by the biscuit industry to lobby for replacement of cooked meals by biscuit packets. And the entire story is quite astonishing. So what happened is that a so-called Biscuit Manufacturers Association wrote to many members, maybe all members of parliament, and gave them all kinds of pseudo-scientific arguments for replacing cooked meals with biscuits. And then what happened, even more surprisingly, is that many of these MPs, perhaps because they have been baited or persuaded in some other way, 
forwarded that letter to the Human Resource Development Minister or paraphrased it and signed it in their own name and made their own case for midday meals to be replaced with biscuits across political parties except for the Communist parties and the Bahujan Samaj Party, the Dalit Party of North India. All the other parties were party to this, so they wrote to the Human Resource Minister and made this case for replacing meals with biscuits. Fortunately, the minister resisted that. He consulted the state governments, consulted nutritionists, and came to the firm conclusion that there was no case for replacing cooked meals with biscuits, and so <laughs> refused to act on this. But it could have turned out another way. And in fact, similar lobbying activities have continued, not so much in the context of school meals, but in the context of meals and take-home rations for the younger children below the age of six years under the Integrated Child Development Services. So essentially, it would be a proposition to have packaged processed foods like biscuits as the dry ration food rather than a freshly cooked, nutritious meal. This program, as Jean notes, is basically a supplementary meal for children. So how much food kids get all boils down to how much money is allocated for the program. There's been at least two incidents when the budgets for the midday meal program have been cut quite severely. And currently, there's less money spent on the program now than ever in the past. So until 2014, the budget for midday meals was growing quite steadily in real terms. I remember that, that was a period when the Indian economy was also growing quite fast. And so naturally, that generated more government revenue, and that made it possible to increase the budget in real terms year after year. Since 2014, however, since the NDA government came to power, the allocation for midday meal has not only been frozen, it's actually been reduced on two occasions. Once in 2015, that was the first uh, full budget of the first NDA government. And then again this year in 2021. And if you look at the combined effect of these cuts, what it means in practical terms is that in real terms, the budget available for Minty Mills today from the central government is about 30% lower than it was seven years ago. That, of course, is a big, big obstacle to continued improvement in the scheme and particularly an obstacle to continued improvement in the nutritious content of the meal. Jean says that ideally this is a program that should lie under the purview of the state and then have its execution depend on community infrastructure. There's little reason to corporatize the program or to brand it, which is the current goal of the PM portion, the name the current government, led by Prime Minister Modi, now calls the midday meal. Well, so far as I can tell, the only purpose of this uh, PM portion scheme is to tag the name of the Prime Minister to the program because there's nothing new otherwise. It's basically the same old school meal scheme with the same money and pretty much the same guidelines renamed PM portion. There may be some minor frills added. There is some talk, for example, of extending it to children at the pre-primary stage. But in any case, those are already being fed right now under a different program under, under the Integrated Child Development Services. So in fact, today I read the PM portion guidelines and I can't see anything that's not there already. So the main thing is it basically seems to be a repackaging of the existing program with the Prime Minister's name added and no extra financial allocation. So there's really nothing much to say about that program. Jean points us to the disturbing power of rebranding, which in this case at least has almost nothing to do with making actual improvements to the scheme. As Jean mentioned, in order for the program to actually improve, it will require significant re-evaluation of public fund distribution. This is a move upon which the future of the midday meal depends. But frankly, it's an unlikely outcome under a government that has a lot of interest in the future, but little investment in children. The fact that, you know, you learn simple good habits like queuing up or, you know, sharing your meal with others, sitting together, the whole socialization aspect of it, where I've met children who were given packed food by their parents at home because they come from more privileged backgrounds and often from caste privileged backgrounds and they're told that they mustn't eat at school because 
the food is cooked either by a lady from another religion or caste community but when these kids they go to school and they see everyone sitting and having this steaming hot food they quietly eat and they don't tell their parents yeah so it helps in breaking down all these unnecessary barriers the success of the midday meal historically is definitely something that needs to be acknowledged feeding 120 million children is no easy task at the same time these conversations have illuminated how politics more than anything else have shaped the scheme's development despite protests resistance and interference by industry the program is still going but as jean and rithika have shown us the threats to basic food rights are real as they're linked to not only nutrition but a larger cosmology of power structures and this is why a setback in the program won't just be about less well-fed kids it will also reverse any progress that has been made to gender and caste inequality as a result of it we hope you'll join us again for our next episode of bad table manners and beyond this episode is possible because of all the people who work behind the scenes I'd like to thank my producer Jennifer O'Neill, audio editor Evan Lindsay, researchers Julia Fine and Carolyn Crosby, and intern Kai Stone. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glasier, sound engineer Max Kotelchuk, associate producer Quentin Lebo, and sound intern Simon Livendar. You can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can learn more about Bad Table Manners at whetstoneradio.com.